and welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am Crypto. And I am Musik Macabre. Our special guest, I don't want you to glance over, head over to their channel where they actually do the most amazing musical performances you will ever see in your life. Their, their performance of the uh, Telltale Heart, Good Country People, absolute fire, and they are releasing the in the penal colony at the same time as this video is going live. So go over and check that video out immediately. You're going to make me cry over here. Yeah, that's some good stuff there. Lit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make the lit lit. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a longer story. We've been talking about, okay, what would be a good story to kind of do a collab chat on? And so I don't want to go through in too many details, but at a high level, we're on a penal colony area. Right. We're, we're dealing with correctional facilities. We're dealing with an explorer, or I think it's sometimes called the traveler, depending on your translation, heading out to this island to basically meet these people and basically gets a tour of their torture device, their punishment system, and perhaps procedures or lack thereof procedures <laughs> for how these get kicked <laughs> off. And it's brutal. Like many things with Franz Kafka, we've got tons of themes of alienation, of uh, emotions, raw torture. It's it's an, it's an intense story, and I think it's going to be a treat to go through because Kafka is one of those writers that just puts layers and layers into his writing. Yeah, there's so many layers in this one, and I love like this unsettling tone that you get. It's very, uh, like I guess you would say like. It has that gray overfeel. Like if this was made into a show or a movie, it would have to be shot old school, like black and white with that grainy look. It just has that 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 grit feel to it to me. It really makes me wonder why it hasn't been shot into a show or a movie yet. Maybe I'm missing something. But just real quick, who should direct that? Oh, oh. gosh. Ah. Uh. Who's the guy that did Get Out? I think he could have a good eye for Ooh, it. Uh, is Jordan that Jordan Peele? Peele? Yeah. Yes, I love his <laughs> horror-esque, like, thriller stuff. He, his stuff is top-notch. Yeah, what he would do is he'd make it extremely psychological. He would get into those characters' heads, and I would I would just love that ride. That'd be killer. I would enjoy that ride, too, and I, I had another one in mind just because I watched Django Unchained the other day, but it would be an awesome... Uh, an, an awesome Tarantino movie, and I think Christopher Waltz would make a good officer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's not too far yeah. from the, um, what was that movie? The Inglorious Bastards, I think it was, that it's not mm -hmm. too far of a stretch to see how he, you know, just the way that he played with people in the scenes, knowing the people that were underneath in the uh, basement below in the opening scene, or even in that basement scene. He knows how to increase the tension, and I feel like that's what you get in this story, too right? You're, you're in the mind of this traveler who's like, I can't believe I'm here. I don't want to be messing with these people right now. Can I please just go? I'm going to tell you that this is not a good idea. I don't approve any of this. And you just, you're just waiting for that release through this whole story. It's mm. just constantly building up this tension inside of you. So let's, let's start off with here to make sure, you know, everybody out there, what is a penal colony? Like it's in the title and I don't think it really describes it the best in the story, but to make sure we're on the same page, do you guys know what that is? So there's just a certain way that it, that, like maybe I just had an assumption when I uh, came into it, but I figured that they were somehow, well, well so they, they were on an island, there was a harbor in the story. So I just got a, a feel that this was an island just completely meant for uh, prisoners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the feeling that we're supposed to get. And at first it's like, okay, well, we don't do that too often anymore. It used to be a lot more popular back in the day. And the story was written, I think, was it uh, 1914, published in 1919? So a little bit more of a period piece. But we move into the eyes of the traveler going onto this island and we come across the apparatus fairly quickly. And how do you describe this apparatus, because depending on how each of us viewed this, maybe we could go off a couple different directions for how it's interpreted. How did you guys take the uh, apparatus? Let's start with you, Bazik. Uh, I took it in a lot of different ways. Like um, the, just the, the overall literal description is it in, in my mind, it appeared as this towering structure 
made of wood, but uh, complete with electronics and batteries and exposed wires and everything like that, like all kind of plastered on. But the the, the way that uh, he described it was that this was a at one uh, one time apparatus, beautiful beautiful device that was you that was really well maintained, but had a dastardly purpose of of carving people up in in ways that were uh commiserate to whatever crime that they that that they did but you get the like from the descriptions i I get this feeling that there's this beautiful tall towering structure with like shimmering blades and wires and batteries and things like that uh but over time it's kind of become dilapidated and ill-maintained and it really created a, a a really haunting atmosphere for me when i when i was like thinking through the, what that apparatus what actually was and looked like. It kind of reminds me in a sense, have you ever seen pictures of the modern day Colosseum in Italy? You yeah. know, a place where people were put to brutally inflict pain for other people's pleasure, you know, a, a long time ago. And you see how it's become dilapidated with time, right? Like they, some of the walls have fallen down in the same way that this apparatus was described, like when it was created under the old commandant, Oh, everybody came out to watch this apparatus work. And it was like this big spectacle, kind of like the Coliseum. And now, I mean, the straps are breaking. We don't have funds to maintain it anymore. And it's just this rundown image of what once was a, a almost glory symbol of the previous regime almost. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I took it a little bit, I guess, different, I guess, with the religious undertones of the whole piece. For me, I I envision some almost very archaic device that, while maybe something modern that's dilapidated, it looks very, very medieval, like almost a torture device. And with that religious idea, and I I don't know, I I thought of almost like uh, the rack and something that was, you know, had all these pulleys and, and systems and chains and lots of blades. And then it was almost used to like rip people in half is kind of how I, I, I took this, this terrible, terrible device. And maybe that says something horrible about my brain. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I've, I've been trying to decide whose brain is the most horrible because I kind of like giddily describe this thing. Yikes. What does that say about me? <laughs> well, I know you said you've read this before. I read this for the first time just now in preparation for this talk. And I was like, I need to go through that a second time. Like that was intense. And the first time I read it, I was not laughing. I I was not giggling. I I was very dead serious the first time I read that. Like, I'm like, wow, this is really dark. And then I read it a second time. And the, just the way some things are described when like, you know, the traveler's like looking at this device. And then he says like, he's like caught off guard by suddenly the, the other prisoner is also like right there looking at it as well. It's like, wait, wait, what? Like, <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. And all of a sudden I found myself almost kind of like giggling, like you, like you described at some parts that were probably crossing the line, right? Like it, 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 in terms of humor, it went over the line and that's what made it humorous. That's what made it allowed to be looked at almost in a more fictional sense when you realized how ridiculous some of the stuff was. Like case in point, when we learn what the man's sentence was. It was like the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Like, like, wait, what? He didn't stand up and salute the officer? Like, It, it does feel like it's moving into that satirical, like, ridiculousness. And we were talking about who, how this would be filmed and stuff. And if you look at it from that way, this would be one of those, like, spoof movies almost that it's so stupid. And I just imagine um, that scene. I can't remember what the movie is where – uh, the guy looks over and they're about to be hung and he goes, eh, first time, huh? Like it, it gets to that kind of silliness of like, really, this is, this is what's happening. So I, I've, I've lived with this thing for a while, this story. And, um, I, the first, my, my, my first reading through it, it may it, like, this, this is why it's Tarantino because we, we we've got well, why I chose Tarantino because it's over the top violent but there is some satire. There, there's some satire and humor in there. Uh, the way that it frames up the like how he wants to push this through bureaucratic structures and stuff like that, kind of like that 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 war going on. There's there's a little bit of uh, funny satire there. Then you get like uh, you, you just get jolted into unexpected bouts of uh, violence. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's kind of how it struck me. Um, and I, I've read it a few times now, and that's kind of stuck with me. 
Now, speaking of the violence, because I looked at this coming from a religious standpoint, I don't know if you did it either. Did you feel like maybe part of the story almost there was two pieces to it of one piece being more feeling Old Testament with that violence versus New Testament? Oh, yeah, for sure. And then not only that, this new commandant, right, he has this faith, this belief in the machine in the old ways of life, which was very kind of like, if you're going to say Old Testament, very eye for an eye, right? Like if you did one thing wrong, you're going to like, you're going to have the equal amount done to you, I guess, as punishment. And it's always going to be physical. It's going to be, this is prescribed exactly what we're going to do. I just want to, one second, I believe it's the officer that you might be, because the the new commandant is the one who's, yeah, okay. You're right, you're right. My, My mistake. And the officer is the one who, by the end, is almost, um, do we say the word sacrificing himself? He he believes so much in this ideal that he puts himself on this machine at the end and is almost taking on the punishment of others, almost kind of like a, a weird look at a Jesus Christ, in a sense. And then that's what ushers in the new generation. And you have this prophecy from the grave of the old commandant that says, I will return, have faith followers. And even, you know, like that idea of having this epiphany while you're going through a torture, it sounded a lot like how sometimes you'll think about, I say you'll think about, some people will view religion as a form of punishment, right? Break a law, this is your punishment in a sense. And sometimes that punishment is meant to make you come closer to the religion, come closer to the punishment that's being forced upon you. And that's kind of what I guess this officer is doing too, where he's seeing these punishments and he's like, I can't wait for this epiphany. And he like gets close to like, watch, because he can't wait to see it in their eyes. It's, it's, it's a perverted look at, at religion sometimes too, I think sometimes, the way I interpreted this. Yeah, it, it, it was uh, really, really, a really powerful part of it, like seeing that he believed this so strongly. And um, it was it was telling that when he was going through the torture himself, be just, he didn't have that same epiphany. The uh, explorer couldn't see that in his eyes. And I thought that was re- was really telling about like how devoted he was to this old institution and how he put everything into upholding it, but then was completely robbed of the uh, justice that he sought for himself using that thing. Yeah. Did either of you have any, because they kind of talked about how the traveler or the explorer was representing like the European way of thinking. He was kind of like, the opposite of the, you know, this is how we do it in the penal colony. Like we do this medieval torture here, you crazy enlightened Europeans, you're going to change our ways. Did you guys have any takeaways on the old and new with kind of like how we think about European enlightenment and, and how that impacted perhaps the barbaric practices of medieval times even? I don't know if I went back as far as medieval times, Maybe it's just because I'm taught this a couple of months ago. But for me, I saw a lot of parallels between colonialism and imperialism of the 19th century of what Europeans were doing into to Africa and Asia and India and areas around the world. And there, there's a lot of that powerful charged language I feel in this. Um, and I, I think Kafka is, is referencing like some very specific people of that brutality. And, and if you think of some of the horrible things that the people in the penal colony are doing to themselves, and then the outside view of the Europeans are coming in and saying, oh, you're so terrible, we're going to come in and fix you. And I feel like the travel is that European coming in judging. And if you think of somebody like what was going on in um, – in Africa with like King Leopold where you know he's you know doing all these brutalities to his own people and and because now he controls this area and the other Europeans are looking down upon it but they're hiding it as well uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of parallels between the European imperialism into um, you know the African scramble and stuff and maybe I'm drawing a little too much on that because I just taught that recently in my class but I, I felt like with all that violence there's a justification for it in this piece. You know, when, when I think about like the, the fact that you taught that recently and then that becomes kind of a prism by which you're, you're viewing this, that light's passing you through that in, in, in this kind of way, like there, there's other things I, I was thinking about too that I'm, I'm not necessarily sure that Kafka was intending when he wrote it, but 
it hit me in, in different ways that it may, have, it may have intended. And one part about that is when we talk about the brutality that the old commandant had sanctioned and was like the, the lay of the land and the way of the world, one of the uh, points that the officer uh, brought up when he was lamenting the new ways was that, oh, the commandant is listening to his women. This new commandant is listening to all these women who have these different ideas about how things should be run and want to soften up like uh, the, the, the way things that have always been done. So there, there was a, a strong feeling that, that I got that there was this sexism that was playing out and that kind of represented uh, and that would have been like a, a lot more, a lot different when he's writing at a time where women in America couldn't vote and everything like that. But um, I, I, it, I saw uh, a lot of like kind of old world ideals kind of being paralleled and used for uh, to, to, to represent this old torture justice that was being upheld. Did you guys get any totalitarian feels to this? The idea how I almost felt like the old commandant, like whatever he said went. Right. He was the colony at one point. I think the officer was kind of like praising the old commandant and how dare the new commandant try and come in and change things and make things equal and less barbaric in a sense. And if we think about the apparatus, the apparatus by itself does nothing. In the hands of a totalitarian or person with power who can't be challenged, like the officer who's judge and jury, this tool this, this apparatus becomes a tool of totalitarian regimes to inflict direct harm on its people. Yeah, I got a, a strong sense of totalitarianism and worship of that. And to, to know that the office, like, like they're moving to the softer uh, regime where there is more uh, distributed power and things like that. And this officer who was subservient in the old, uh, old regime was still clinging on to those old ideas was, it was like really jarring to see how, how desperately he was clinging on. He had some power in this, in this structure. So it was jarring to see how, how desperately he was clinging on to that totalitarian structure. There was another aspect that hit me about it as well, which was the bureaucracy of it all. Uh, some of the point, one of the points that the officer had made about the old commandant and his infinite wisdom was that he had uh, done so much bureaucratically, had, had, had gotten this so deeply tied that any administrator who wanted to make change would find it extremely difficult to do. So not only do you have this, uh, like this violent totalitarian aspect, that bureaucratic aspect, maybe because, you know, a lot of work that we do is with bureaucratic organizations. It, it kind of, it really hit hard from the point uh, from the perspective of like the bureaucracies that, that people will put in place and all the checks and, and things that, that people put in place that, that really keep upholding outmoded methods and ideas. I also felt like, because if, if you take together all of what we've said so far, this human-made device, this human-made torture device could be seen as not necessarily just maybe totalitarianism, but the westernization of different areas of the world as well, that they're imposing their values from the old to the new. They're imposing their laws. This is how, you know, if you slip up that that simple, that little of a slip up, we're going to kill you. And this is how we're going to have world order. I really feel like it, it is pushing this new westernized agenda across the entire globe. And I, I feel like that that's the desire of the people and that Kafka is questioning maybe uh, the way I saw it of, is this what we want for, for the world, this one uniformity? Here's a question for you. So if we are accepting that this is, okay, in one view that this is commentary on that, what does it mean that this is, when we think about society, we have, if we have laws, we must have punishment, right? Because if you break a law, th there should be some type of repercussion, right? Because otherwise, why would anyone follow the law? It's part of the, uh, well, who is that? Is that Blackstone's ratio? Better to let one innocent go than punish 10, 10 criminals, something along those lines. But here we're in a penal colony where people have already done something wrong, theoretically. What does that mean for due process and justice, quote unquote, where anything they could do is under immediate grounds for whatever your ruler is up for deciding? The fact that, that they've literally got no due process, no human rights, how does that make us view 
I guess, the usage of this machine and the leaders. And does everyone deserve those human rights, I guess, is maybe one thing that you can kind of ask out of this, too, is do you give up your rights, I guess, being in the penal colony? Well, it's a very archaic form of punishment, right? It's that idea of isolation. And we hadn't talked a lot about that, but normally when you think you think prisoner, you think a jail, they're being isolated, but you think penal colony, it's more of like there's an island, like Australia was a penal colony for the British, and that this this form of punishment is is very, you know, lonely, and that is that enough for them to be punished? Does there have to be something further to enforce these the, these these rules that are being implemented on these people because why are you being punished? We broke the rules and they're trying... The, this punishment is supposed to reform you, right? It's supposed to make you so you don't break those rules again. Yeah, and, and when you get to like really examining why are you being punished if, if the, the intention is some sort of reform, uh, they certainly... The, the apparatus uh, certainly wasn't actually delivering on on, on reform. Uh, you had a single judge and jury, the officer, and then his gauge of whether a reform had occurred was an expression on somebody's face while they were being stabbed by a needle. And uh, that was kind of like his definition of it. So it, it does strike me as a, like a question of we're <laughs> the only time that we're told why anybody was being punished. It was for the absolute most ridiculous possible thing, falling asleep at a post then slapped in the face by a whip and then sentenced to whatever the officer's whims may be, which were of course death. So, uh, it, 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 it takes that question of, um, like, are we like, are we deserving or if somebody has committed some crime and, uh, they get, get their sentence, are they deserving of everything that happens after that sentence? It takes that and reduces it to, the most absurd possible uh, scenario that could happen. Yeah, you know, one of the things you said there was reform. And how can you reform if there's no notice? If you don't know what you did wrong, like this, this condemned man, this prisoner had no clue. He had never been told. And, and the idea is like, oh, well, you'll, you'll pay attention to when the pain and the punishment's happening. I'm sure you'll be able to figure out what they're writing into your flesh. Like that, that's when reform can happen. This is like, no, that, that's not how reform happens. <laughs> When we think about it too, there's two forms of punishment, right? There's physical punishment, you know, f being physically harmed, pain, but then there's also mental anguish. And I feel like being in the prison itself is one form of punishment of mental anguish. You can't see your family and friends. You're isolated. You don't have friends. You're maybe segregated because of, you know, whatever reasons. And then you have the this looming device that is going to cause you physical pain and until your death, oh man, like that, the, these two mechanisms are, are heartbreaking in this story and it doesn't seem like it's fair. And maybe, maybe that's one of the things that Kafka was looking to get is that the, this punishment, regardless of it's supposed to make you better or not, it, it can't be fair to people. So why have it? What's the alternative? What should we do? That's a great point to bring up about Kafka too. Uh, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of his writings have this like looming sense of something that you absolutely can't control. And even in a situation where they're like, we, we looked here and there's this concept of potential redemption for the officer, but he made sure to take that away. And for the condemned man, there was nothing to be redeemed for. He could only be freed uh, from the punishment structure. So I, I, I think that is a, re a really powerful way to look at it. And another thought that I wanted to throw out there was, um, not only is like not only is punishment supposedly a tool of reform, but doesn't it doesn't punishment also kind of satisfy some need of the uh, of the punisher of the person who is uh, like designing all these tortures? Like he's getting a lot more out of it than the concept that somebody's going to be redeemed. And I'm going to finish that note with uh, men will build an apparatus designed to inscribe crimes into people's backs through torturing them and uh, like stabbing and sewing their sewing the name of the crime with a needle and then defend that apparatus all the way to their death rather than seeking a therapist. And the author's death symbolizes all that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you bring up a really good point about multiple themes, right? So 
looking at Kafka across the board, you mentioned, you know, your theme just there, but also alienation, you know, isolationism. That's also a theme that runs through Kafka. And when we look at, you now to your, to your question about this, this officer, he very clearly, he wasn't in this for, I think the reform, like, I think there was self pleasure out of it. And if you even look at, you know, I'm more familiar, obviously, rather than, you know, 1900s, German, Austrian <laughs> legal practices. I'm more familiar with American practices. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who, there's like a, a room that like, let's say you are going to be, you know, executed. There are people that can sign up and, and watch it happen. There's there's a viewing room for when, when that happens sometimes. And I always ask myself, why would you want to watch that? Like to me, and I guess, you know, when some people see something terrible happen to someone that they love, uh, whether it be they lost someone along those lines, is this their form of catharsis? How do they learn to live with their loss and feel like they've gotten some form of justice in a sense? And maybe in some states, maybe locking them away is the only option, but in some states you can perform executions and such. And there are people that will literally watch it happen like they get something out of it and this officer it, it's not the same thing apples to oranges in this situation but the officer was that guy that wanted to watch it happen he wanted to be the hand that pulled the lever because when he was pulling that lever it was an extension of him getting something pleasurable out of inflicting pain on another human being you know th that 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 really makes me think about this um episode of Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Anybody watch that or listen to that? It's a podcast. Okay. And uh, he goes into detail about in the medieval era and, and before about how when there was a, an execution, that would be like, you didn't have television, iPhones, you didn't have Codex Cantina to watch, like everybody <laughs> had to, uh, yeah. That was entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, every uh, the, like you, you had everybody surrounding and watching all these awful things happening to people. And then we fast forward to the, when this was written and how the officer's description of like, under the old commandant, everybody would come out. We had to put these railings up that people would push over trying to see the, the, the torture justice happening. But then something changed over time. And it, it does make me wonder, did, did anybody get a feeling for what might have changed in the story to get people away from that, viewing this as a spectator sport to being overall disgusted by it? I think it comes back to what I kind of said at the beginning of maybe this is that transfer of Old Testament to New Testament of the the eye for the eye to be more forgiving of one another of like, hey, we tried. We were, we're really good at killing each other. It's like what humans do best, you know, showing our inhumanity. Maybe it's time to show our humanity and that we can be kind to one another. We can be better to one another. And that's the only way we're going to improve and, and move forward together as a society is, is turning over that new leaf. Now here's um this question's a little off the wall, but you mentioned Musique a second ago about how he was willing to die for his belief in this machine. And his sentence was written out to be be just. I guess the question is, what does it mean that he that the sentence was be just? And then what does it mean that the sentence couldn't be carried out and he was literally stabbed to death by that sentence in a sense, too? I, I really feel like it, it means that it was impossible for him to, to find any true redemption. There's a couple of things that I think about, which uh, one of them is that, hey, it, like based on the, like just based on the nature of the, this device, there's no, there's no justice through here. But the other uh, idea is that perhaps he didn't sacrifice himself in order to find that uh, uh, that redemption, but instead he knew that his era was over and uh, he knew that he would never get what he wanted. So he decided it was just time to throw his life away. So there was no redemption even available. He didn't go through it with the honest intention. He was just there to say, well, this regime's changing. I'm out of here and uh, just end his life that way. He really can't conform to the change of societies, right? 
that could be another thing of people sometimes that are stuck in the past can't move forward they 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 aren't able to progress and change and and move over with the times as as things evolve as people see things differently or don't want to do things how they were done in the past yeah and he he couldn't give any kind of inclination no understanding no thought uh, to the new way of doing things. So that, that could be spot on. He was just absolutely incapable of uh, moving past this. Did you guys feel, I don't want to know, I don't know what the word is. I don't know if it's compassion, fear, but when you knew that the condemned man was going to be put on this machine and that he was going to die, did you feel something of you didn't want him to die? Or were you, how did you feel when you knew that he, he was going to be put on the machine the first time reading it. I don't remember all the way back then, but I, I feel like the first time reading it, um, I had no idea what was going to happen. I didn't know what this apparatus was for. I knew it was dastardly, but, uh, I had no idea why this person was there, but yeah, I was totally on the side of this person who's, we didn't even talk about the fact that his, he didn't even know what the crime, uh, crime was. He had no way of understanding because he didn't even understand the language that was being spoken. And yet he's about to be, scissored by this this massive machine so yeah 100 percent uh on the side of the condemned man yeah 100 percent. i think that that's kind of way he's portrayed as, as stupid and lesser than and i think you're supposed to feel some type of empathy for in him as he's you know the the jokester of the story of trying to lighten things up a little bit that you're you're supposed to feel for this individual he's i think he's supposed to be the only quote good person of the story really except for maybe the officer but as as you pointed out, I don't know if the officer is really doing this for an altruistic view or, or reason, right? He's just he's doing it to, because he can't move on. When you say officer, do you mean the um, you mean the traveler? Like he he's the other good guy, or do you mean the officer that was doing the machine work? The officer doing the machine work. Oh, oh, though that's a spicy that, take. That's a spicy one yeah. right there. Wow. <laughs> Okay. I, I, I'd love, uh, would you mind, um, like you said, the, the officer being perceived like being the, like that Kafka uh, was trying to portray him as good. Would you mind uh, delving into that? Cause I, I thought that like his old, his old way of thinking and everything like that was oppressive and torturous, but, um, cu yeah, curious your thoughts on that one. Well, I feel like he sees the wrong in this and he, he wants to, to sacrifice, but he, he can't move forward. He knows that this is going to happen regardless. I guess it's kind of the idea of not self-sacrifice, but uh, the, 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 the train exercise, right? Do you kill one or do you kill five? Uh, do you kill them with a, a death that is uh, glorious? Do you give them a quick death? I, and I feel like he knows that this guy is going to die, so let him have some dignity because he's never been treated with dignity in the story, the condemned man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just, he, he seems to be portrayed so poorly that he's quote, so inferior to everybody else. And maybe the officer feels sorry for him. I don't know. Mm, interesting. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm like, like I, lots I, of layers here, right? Definitely. <laughs> you weren't yeah. expecting that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I read it with a different interpretation, but uh, yeah, the, the idea that this, I like, I, I had this kind of like, oppression of the old way type thing but we can still imagine that that people who believe in this old way that, that the officer himself from his perspective he was giving them a dignified death that they otherwise wouldn't have received so uh yeah exactly wow my mind's a little bit open uh on that one because yeah. they don't think they're doing wrong right i mean well it's, yeah it's the um it's the nuremberg trial problem right like it is is doing my job a, a legitimate defense when you know you're doing something morally wrong? And the, the first question is, do we think the officer believes he's doing something morally wrong? And I guess that's harder for me to know. I guess I, I was more along on Uzik's line where I was kind of thinking like, okay, he's representing the old oppressive regime. He's the one that's kind of brutally enforcing things without even hearing a defense from the people that that seems like if you could just have your will become law, then you're not really trying to interact in a society. You're trying to overlord and power over a society. And I guess, 
I guess in my mind, I thought that was always morally long, but I guess, uh, I guess we could look at that differently, perhaps. Or is, I mean, is the officer the tool? I mean, do you blame the person or the gun? Well, he, that, that, that comes down to the question. Do we think he morally thought what he was doing was wrong? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. If we put it to a vote, uh, my vote is on, uh, look, I'm not, I'm not defending the officer here. I'm not saying I like the officer. No, no, neither am I. Neither am I. I don't even to think that. Oh, God. Oh, I'm going to get so much hate in the comments below. Uh, that crypto. Uh, I'm, all I'm saying is that I, I actually do believe the author thought that he was uh, in his right. And what we, we wouldn't be able to, to process the story in the right way if we just thought that the officer was just blindly and wantonly uh, wanting to do the worst thing possible at all times. Like we, it, we would blind ourselves to being able to figure out people's motivations and how to work with them and how to win in scenarios where somebody believes that they're doing right, but they are oppressing others, other individuals or other mass groups of people. It is a good point. I guess that, that, yeah. yeah. And I guess that brings it back to the thing of like, I taught uh, recently a couple of months ago in my world history class in, in, for me, again, seeing this as imperialism of that idea of uh, the, the the horrendous idea of white man's burden of the Europeans thinking they're superior and going into these places. That's kind of the idea of the officer, right? He sees himself as superior and he sees like he's doing a good thing for these people. Again, not trying to justify him, just an interpretation that I think some readers may come to in this story. Well, that was a curveball. I was supposed to throw the curveball because I was originally going to ask the question, if you felt compassion for the condemned man, would we potentially change our minds if we knew why he was a condemned man? So imagine if we go back to that scene where we, why do people go to executions to watch them? Whether it be today, whether it be the Colosseum in Italy many, many years ago, whether it be on this podcast show that, that Musique mentioned, there's something about us wanting to witness someone being punished for doing something wrong. What if we knew what the condemned man did was wrong? And what if we agreed that it was morally horrendous, whether he harmed someone that you knew personally or, or that you thought was just objectively wrong, would you view it instead as catharsis where you looked forward to the condemned man potentially receiving a sentence that you thought he should have received all along? You know, there, there is uh, like, like, what is it called? Schadenfreude where there is a uh, catharsis seeing harm come to those who have, who have wronged others or harmed you, et cetera. Uh, but um, it's uh, like, like I, I can, I'm dodging the spirit of the question here by saying that's that, that how grotesque the nature of uh, this machine is. Oh, I don't you stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Ah. <laughs> uh. But, uh, but yes, no longer to go first, Una. No, no more <laughs> guests going first. I'll die on that now. <laughs> but uh, I, I think that it would it would take me going into the mindset of hundreds of years past to be able to look at something like that and uh, think that it's deserved. And that's only because uh, I mean, that, like I'm I'm flavored by the the, the time that I live in and torture just 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 like no matter what somebody has done that's just not uh what i what, what i think is the right way of uh coming to to some kind of absolution oh that's a great i love that line uh torture justice that's great 100 <laughs> percent agree yeah that was my answer too i i think that people should get their comeuppings uh but i think that the punishment should fit the crime and i don't think that anybody should be brutally killed or tortured uh, no matter, I guess, how terrible their crime is. I don't know. I've never been put in that situation. So I know that they always say that there is evil in all of us, I guess, if, if you're pushed to that limit. But I don't feel like in this story, who, who's pushed to this limit? I mean, why, why they, they're just kind of following the, the old commandant's way of things. And that's not how we should be as a society. In my opinion, we should be better than that. With the concept of the punishment should fit the crime. Like it takes us back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, which is reform. And it's a blurry line these days because our prisons are, are called uh, reform facilities and things like that. Yet 
there's not uh, a lot of reform uh, that that there's there's not a lot in there that leads to to that reformation. So, like we have this idea of the punishment fitting the crime, but what's the result of that? Like what 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 uh, like by the uh, by the, the the types of the punishment? Like should we focus on how the punishment fits the crime or how the punishment prevents future crime? Um, or pre like prevents recidivism and things like that. And I mean, like those are questions that I, I, ha I haven't examined extremely deeply, but it like, like seeing this torture justice being played out, thinking from the perspective of the commandant and uh, thinking per per uh, from the perspective of the society that uh, is being protected from whatever the condemned man uh, did, like, is it enough that he's now on the island and uh, away from being able to do harm to people outside of that punishment structure? There, there's a whole lot to think about uh, in terms of, well, punishment fits crime, but does that actually reduce the chance of future harm happening to other people in society? Or people doing it again, right? Yeah. If you, if you, one thing that I think is, you know, kind of ridiculous is if my students get so many tardies, they're put in, you know, ISS, they go into the little room with all the other quote, you know, kids that did something wrong, but it's a vacation for them. They don't have to go to any of their classes, get to sit there and play on their phones all day because the person in there that's monitoring them just sits there and watches them all day. They're still going to be tardy again. It doesn't curb. It doesn't help fix the behavior. It's just like speeding. You know, if I get caught speeding, they punish me by taking my money. That doesn't make me not speed anymore. It just makes me angry that I have less money. <laughs> <laughs> And if you can buy your way out of things, you know, with, with throwing like the idea of, you know, monetary punishment in here as well, well, you'll continue breaking the laws or doing things wrong if, if it doesn't feel like it's going to change your behavior. Yeah, in all those examples, too, both of you brought up situations where you had notice and where you had process, right? In this story, you had neither, where the condemned man had no idea what he did wrong. He had no ability to defend himself. And there wasn't even reasonable punishment. It was not reasonable crime tied up with reasonable punishment. It was, you know, reasonably small minor crime with, you know, extreme punishment in terms of, of death, essentially. Having 12 hours of torture being dug into your back for the purpose of what? For the purpose of pleasure for the officer, for... I mean, already, like you said, in terms of like the philosophy of justice, there's like, I think, five different main core tenets, one of them being isolation from harming society, one being the ability to reform the individual to reintegrate them into society. And I don't remember the other three, but this is clearly where he was away and not able to harm society anymore. And he's being put to like the most intense thing possible for something that was what biological, like getting up to salute every hour isn't there something like you have to sleep for a certain period of time before you start to like hallucinate like isn't that like already a torture where if you had to wake up every time you started to fall asleep like don't you start to like kind of like lose your mind like it just seems like something that like doesn't make any sense whatsoever mm -hmm. yeah i feel like this is one of those things of like you, you talk back to one of your parents you didn't honor them correctly and you <laughs> get this horrible punishment be like well i didn't know like teach me and explain to me why i'm supposed to be doing this not just the punishment comes first and then you try to retrospectively teach me what i did wrong why it's wrong and how i'm supposed to go about it it just doesn't seem fair at all <laughs> i love you mom you can I love you. <laughs> I love you, mom. I love you, dad. But Kafka's dad, I don't love you. So I, 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 it's hard to talk about Kafka without like bringing up the horrible relationship that he had with his dad. And you said the P word, you said parents and just like immediately made me think of perhaps. And this is like, like I, I try not to speculate into what somebody might have been thinking, but uh, maybe this old guard way of thinking that was being defended and was so oppressive like if if you look at like the the letters and uh, thoughts that Kafka had about his father, uh, and how that relationship felt inescapably horrible and and painful, and he he couldn't uh, be himself in any way, there might be a stand in there with that old uh, oppressive way of thinking that 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 might be a, st a stand in for uh, Kafka's father. You know what? You bring up a really good point too that we haven't talked about, and that's 
if we put ourselves in the situation of you see something happening that is morally wrong in terms of this torture device that's happening, and he's being said, can you go to the new commandant and please tell him that this is okay? You don't have to say anything. Just tell him, like, yeah, I saw it. Like, please just don't interfere. And if I think about when we today see people having something that's done wrong, uh, what do we do in the old day? Let's say someone was being robbed or like when you, when you see like uh, the old movies, like what was it like home alone where he's like robbing a store and like the police officers are like, Hey, that kid. And the police officer like goes after the kid. And like, even like the store worker tries to stop the kid mm-hmm. and no store worker trying to stop no kid in today's, you know, modern <laughs> laws, but people would, they're making a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> people would step in and do something to stop in like something that they thought was unjust in the old days today what do you do as crypto just mentioned you pull out your phone you watch in this story he just kind of watches when the machine's kind of happening he doesn't interfere he doesn't stop and same with the condemned man what is it about these men knowing something's wrong but doing nothing to stop it isn't that really right ironic too that this story uh, is written 1914, but isn't published till 1919, right on the cusp of World War One, where a lot of countries around the world had that isolationist view, which we see in this story, and that, well, it's happening over there. It's not our problem. I don't care what happens over with Germany and the Ottoman Empire and everything. And it, it's kind of weird. Like, he almost like he knew it was coming. And then, you know, this is published after the war ends. It's kind of crazy. I'm trying to put myself in uh, the traveler's shoes uh, because you're in a scenario where you're just one person and you're on another turf and you're seeing this oppressive thing happen. Um, The the, the, the first part of the story was like before the officer really knew what the device was doing, he was indifferent, like whatever. Then he started becoming intrigued when the officer was showing his excitement toward it. But then uh, he became disgusted as it, it was like torturing the condemned man, but he wasn't really saying anything. And I I, I just have to confess that in my, like I, I would be utterly shocked at the, at, the, at the first part. I would be shocked at like, my mind would be going into what can we do to stop this? But if I, if it's me and this officer and this whole power structure around me that's against me, then I wouldn't know what to do in that scenario. So I w- I, I really thought about that. I was looking at, uh, well, geez, he's just watching this thing happen and not, and not doing it. Is he just a passive player or no? Be, like it, We're used to reading about all, all these heroes who can take matters into their own hands. But really, like when, when we come to, to these entrenched power structures, uh, if we see, like we turn it around and instead of a thief, like what if it's a police officer who is abusing someone in some way, there's brutality going on. There's no way that we can yell or jump in and, and, and fight the fight without, uh, you know, like suffering some serious harm, uh, for ourselves or possibly not even coming out of it alive. So it really makes me think about like, how do we start considering options when we see oppression, when we see violence happening towards others? Like what, what are, what, what are options that we can take? Especially like one, one time, uh, I was out running late at night as I do. Uh, and I saw, uh, there was a car pulled up to the side of the road and there was a couple fighting right the, uh, like right there. And I could tell that the, the guy was much bigger than the woman. It was a very much a domestic abuse situation. But I didn't know how to jump in and, and commandeer the situation. So I uh, ran down the block and called the police. I was able to do something, something very minimal in that uh, in, in that scenario. But thinking through on this person who had nothing of the sort on his side, it, it really, really does beg kind of a question of what we do when we see violence and oppression. I wonder, too, if this is how Kafka said you're going to stand up to that system. I mean, how do you, how does one individual stand up to the system? Kafka from the Balkan areas that has a very tumultuous history going on in 1914. And uh, he probably was kind of a sickly individual dying pretty young of tuberculosis. Uh, I wonder if he saw this as his only way of fighting back is through literature. I mean, they say that the pen is mightier than the sword. 
Well, it's interesting because if we believe that the traveler wanted to do something, because he said several times, this is wrong, I'm going to tell the new commandant that this is not good. Why, when he was leaving the island, why did he not take the other people with him? Like, there's a difference between inaction and then him taking the rope and being like, get off my ship, you can't come with me. Like, he then inserted himself into stopping helping these people too. It's it's a very complex situation, I think. There's a, it's a couple of thoughts that I have on that, which are one, he was a, uh, a selfish <laughs> like ever since he, like once he uh, was uh, satisfied that he had uh, done enough of the right thing, it was like, ta-ta. But uh, <laughs> then there's the question of, we don't know what the condemned man had done to, to be on the island in the first place. And perhaps mm. uh, he, like, I, I'm still thinking about like that, that end scene where he says, no, like, like fights away uh, with the rope and all that. Uh, perhaps he, he does respect the overall, like the overall change that's being brought into the system by this uh, new commandant who won't, who, who, who's against that uh, level of torture that had um, been transpiring. Well, I wonder, do you think his is his MO not to do good or do justice, but to not interfere? Because he said that several times, like where he got there, he like, he wasn't interested in being there. He said several times, like, he's like, well, should I say anything? Like, I don't want to change how these people work is his MO is that he wants to be invisible to how everything is happening here. And his way of being invisible is by not taking people away from the situation that they're in, in a sense too. Yeah. I, I think, I think there is, uh, some of that MO as well. Um, he, yeah, he, he, he's, he's looking at this situation and he realizes how hairy, violent, scary, and ridiculous it is. And it's not like he's, uh, he gives an impassioned speech against the, uh, against the thing. He just talks about how he finds it to be disgusting and would recommend against it to the, to the commandant. But yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot of, Hey, let me see what the minimum is that I can do, but not truly. Uh, be involved in all of these affairs. All right. Well, this has been a very engaging conversation. Music, we really appreciate you coming on here. If anyone has not already opened up another window to go listen to Musique's performance on this, please do that right now because it is going to be absolute fire, I'm sure. And I, I want to thank you all for uh, inviting me on here uh, big, big time admire all the analysis that you, that, you, that you're putting out there. You're making it really accessible. And I just appreciate the stories that you're helping to, uh, shine a light on. Well, we appreciate that. We appreciate that. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. We post videos every Monday and Thursday. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Check out the Kafka playlist down below, below and head over to music's channel. Peace out. Peace. Peace.